All right, welcome into First and Pod. The draft is in a couple of weeks. There's been a massive trade. My book is out in less than two weeks. And Pony is singing on Twitter over the results of regular season hockey games. <laughs> Things are happening. What's up, buddy? And you're leaving out something, and I know you do this deliberately because you are self-effacing uh, on this podcast. You never toot your own horn. Uh, what a performance by you on Colin Cowherd's The Volume Podcast. You got dressed up for it. You had a prop ready to go. There was a book discussion. It ran the gamut. It was incredible. I would urge everyone out there to first subscribe to our podcast. Do that and rate it and review it and tell friends. And then once you're locked in with us, go check out Danny on with Cowherd because it was magical. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Knowing full well many of the times the comments you were going to make, it was just interesting to see the way Cowherd set you up with his classic Cowherd style. So I was a huge fan of that. Thanks, man. Yeah, it was really fun. And how about, I mean, yes, I I, I can be self-deprecating. It's a, a form of comedy that I enjoy, but I'll 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 take the brag from you for a minute. Uh, how about some of the compliments, man? It was it was out of body. I was like, is this Colin Cowherd saying these things? It was yes, that was, was really pretty, cool. It was pretty cool. I'm not I'm not gonna lie. I uh, I was feeling pretty damn. We good need to time. work on him knowing who I am. So yeah. now that you're in, and now that Nick Wright has been in for a while, like I'm gonna just attempt to take some adhesive and stick myself. Yeah, either one of you guys and get into his uh, solar system here eventually. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, I'm in in that I've been a guest on his podcast once. Uh, well, he, he, yeah, there he, might be some he, other things, but I don't want to get into that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. There is that. Well, uh, so here's what we're going to do for our listeners. I have laid out in a rundown form as you get yourself hydrated here. Um, you. Every team that has a first round pick and some topics that come off of them in their draft plans. Now, as we're taping this, we're exactly three weeks away from the draft, and we'll have Baldy on next week to talk prospects, and then a week from now, we'll do our mock draft. I don't know how many picks we'll do, but we'll at least do the top 10 or top 20, cover the Steelers and Bears uh, in that mock draft that we do. Uh, But I want to put you on the clock here and talk about the Bears and – Everyone will expect me to ask you a Caleb Williams question. They listen to this podcast. They know your feelings on Williams. I don't think I've asked you one time what you think they'll do with the ninth pick. Because as you've stated, they are in this incredible catbird situation where they were not a bad team last year. They're getting allegedly a transcendent quarterback. I have my doubts. You don't. That's okay. And they also have another top 10 pick. So what do you think they do? with the ninth pick in the draft, what is the best case scenario? Maybe I'll ask it that way, Danny, for the bears with that pick. So a lot of people think that they will and should trade down because they gave up a second round pick for Montez sweat. But I really disagree with that. I think that they will stay at nine and I think they will make a selection and I think it will be an offensive player. Uh, And I'll get into the scenarios here. It's a top heavy draft. The Bears have a good team, but you need stars. And the ability to pair Caleb Williams with either his Panay Sewell or his Jamar Chase, and those were the guys that was the decision uh, for the Bengals in that draft, is what they can do with the ninth pick. The doomsday scenario for the Bears is if the first eight picks are all offensive players. But then they could say that they get the best offensive player in the draft and the best defensive player in the draft. And I think that would either be Turner, the edge rusher from Bama, or Murphy, the three technique from Texas. I would lean Murphy because of the necessity of Matt Eberflus's defense to have a great three technique. But they need another premium defensive tackle or defensive lineman on the line with Montez Sweat. But I think that they're going to prioritize offense because they already spend more money on the defensive side of the ball than the offensive side of the ball. Keenan Allen's only under contract for this year. He's 32 years old. So what is the best case scenario? Malik Neighbors. That's the best case scenario. 
Now, I don't think he's I was going asking to be... for a realistic scenario when I asked you that question, and Neighbors is not at nine. <laughs> okay, well, then Romo Dunze that. is. Okay. Romo Dunze is. If yeah. four quarterbacks go in the top four, Marvin Harrison Jr. is five, Joe Alt is six, um, Malik Neighbors seven, all you need is one team to take one defensive player. And Atlanta, a lot of people think they will take defense given what they've done at skill position the last three years with Bijan, London, and Pitts. So I think Romo Dunze is the most likely player for the Bears at nine. I think Joe Alt, they would do it. It would be an upgrade of good to great from Braxton Jones. I think Malik Neighbors, again, is the dream scenario because of his speed and how dominant he is out of the slot. And he could learn from Keenan Allen, and then Keenan Allen could be gone in a year, and he would step into the role. So, in order, Roma Dunze, Joe Alt, Malik Neighbors. I mean, again, I would take Neighbors first overall, but in terms of likelihood. And then I would say Murphy and Turner. I will be floored if it's someone other than those five picks. Some people love it to be Brock Bowers. It would be exciting. It would surprise me a bit, given that they signed Gerald Everett and they have Cole Komet under contract. So I don't think it's going to be him. But I think of those five guys, that is one of the people that it will be there for the Bears at nine. And I think they're going to prioritize offense over defense. I'm I'm living in a state where I can't bet on the draft, but I can drive a half an hour to a state where I can. And so I did that last year and made some money like on the Bijan Robinson pick that we talked about going to Atlanta that you mocked me for. And yeah. then it ended up happening. You sold me on Murphy. Like those are very long odds for him to get drafted there. And just hearing you talk it out, I would actually, I would be a little bit surprised if they take another wide receiver, even with Allen being late in his career and only on a one year deal. If, if what you're saying is true about Eberflus, and I have no reason to believe that it's not, and him having a strong desire to have that type of player in his defense, and that's the place where they get him, they can't wait until the second round. A guy like that is not going to be there when they're on the clock again. because they, they don't, don't have, have a second, second round, round pick. They'd have to, exactly. They have to trade back into the second round or trade back into the first round. I think if he's there, I think they'll take I think they could easily take him at nine. If you're saying it's that important of a position in their defense – if he is real juice in the organization, he's going to want them to make that pick. He is. Well, so they, I mean, just, he says the favorite, his favorite player he ever coached is DeForest Buckner. The first move they made in free agency when Poles got here was signing Larry Ogunjobi. It didn't work. He failed the physical, ended up uh, with your team. Then they almost took Jalen Carter if it wasn't for the character issues. They drafted Javon Dexter in the second round. So, they, it's a question of if they like him. It's just a lot of resources on defense. You know, they gave Tremaine Edmonds a ton of money. They gave Jalen Johnson a ton of money. They gave Montez Sweat a ton of money and traded a second-round pick for him. They drafted Jaquan Brisker and Tyree Stevenson and Kyler Gordon in the second round, all since Ryan Poles has been there. So they've just used a lot of resources on the defensive side of the ball. And so I think that they would prioritize offense uh, for Caleb specifically. But Murphy's a very intriguing option because I think they would come out of it, like I said, saying we have the top offensive player and the top defensive player on our board. All right, let's keep going here. What is the better scenario for a quarterback, New England or Washington? Okay, so the obvious answer is probably Washington because Correct. you go through their skill position guys and you see Terry McLaurin there and Jahan Dotson, and they signed Austin Eckler, and I think they've got a tight end who they – they did they bring in a tight end that everyone recognizes or knows? I think they did. I don't know why all of a sudden now my brain has turned into mush after – Because you're singing about hockey. Correct. I think that's what I was about to say about myself. Right. So they've made – it's a veteran guy. It's someone that's been around for a while. I know that because Logan Thomas is gone. Um, so you've got those pieces in place there. Right. And then you've got Cliff Kingsbury. Who Zachers. Been head, Zachers. Okay. Thank you. I knew it was a veteran. And then you have Cliff Kingsbury, who's, you know, who's been a head coach in the NFL as the offensive coordinator there now. Um, I think it's a better destination. So if, if we're assuming that 
that Jaden Daniels is going to be the number two pick. I think Washington is the better destination for him. Okay. If, if you think that Drake may is the number two pick, I actually think he's better off in new England. And the reason why the only I think argument he, I can think of is because you're saying he would sit. Yes. 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 And by the way, on this topic, we've we, we've discussed this before. Maybe it's kind of gotten lost in the abyss because we were all over the place, and some of our podcasts have been a little bit discombobulated and disjointed with everything we've had going on. But now we're locking in. I don't understand how you could look at Jaden Daniels and say, "Let's take a guy who's two years older than Drake May." when he's literally had only one good year as a college quarterback when when Jaden Daniels was when Jaden Daniels was Drake May's age he threw for 10 touchdowns and 10 interceptions you get two extra years if we think best case scenario these guys play till 36 or 37 years old okay would you rather have 13 years of a player or 15 years of a player you want as like if you think the guy's going to be great you want as many years as you can possibly get so well, I mean, obviously the, the differentiating years. factor is if you if you think that he's only one of them is going to be great, you take 13 years of great over 15 years of right. Not but, great. It, I, it, but but I, I listen, I, I agree with you. I I think I, I understand that there is some stuff on Drake May clean up footwork, clean up mechanics. He did more with less. And the guy's got an absolute howitzer of an arm. And we've talked about it before, but Jaden Daniels with a top 20 pick in Brian Thomas Jr. and a top six pick in Malik neighbors. It's it's hard for me to not think that those guys helped make the quarterback. And I know we have examples of Burrow and other guys, uh, CJ Stroud, et cetera, but I'm with you completely. I think Drake may is the obvious second quarterback prospect in this class then, but the only caveat is we don't know if any of these guys are dumb. Like, we, we don't get to talk to them. We don't get to see how they can regurgitate information and like what their ability would be to learn an NFL offense and evaluate things post-snap in the NFL. I have no idea if Drake May's dumb. I have no idea if J.J. McCarthy, even though everyone says he isn't, or Jaden Daniels. Like I, I don't know. So that's something that we just can't know at this point because we haven't been in a room with them for 10 hours. But based on what I've seen, I think Drake May's the obvious second-best prospect. All right, next up, uh, the Cardinals picking at four. Better move staying put and taking Marvin Harrison Jr. or trading the pick? They have so many needs that I think the obvious answer is trading the pick, and they obviously did all of the maneuvering last year in the draft and with, with the Houston trade and then trading back up and getting the tackle. So they've shown a willingness to be aggressive before. So I think that both the Patriots and the Cardinals are pretty obvious trade down spots. And given that you are not one player away, I do think trading down is the move, but I wouldn't trade down if I was Arizona to like 12. Like, you know, I would, I would not trade out of wherever you think, the Bears call them like the blue players on their board. However many blue chip players there are, I do think they need to get a premium talent, but I don't think they necessarily need to get Marvin Harrison Jr. Like if they could trade to seven or to eight, something like that, if that trade exists for them, I would do it. But if it if they have to trade to where like the Raiders are picking, that would be the type of thing that would that would scare me off if I was Arizona. So your answer is you would trade the pick. I would trade the pick as long as I don't have to trade out of the top 10. You know, sometimes we do this and we get influenced by people that we talk to. And so I fell into a trap in the time since the college football season ended, hearing people that had worked in NFL front offices say things like Harrison is the most overrated player in the draft. Like he's not somebody. Yes, I actually heard somebody tell me that who worked in an NFL front office. Like they believe he's going to be a pedestrian wide receiver. I listen, I, I think that there, I, I think neighbors over Harrison is a legitimate opinion to well, have because of the speed. Well, right. Okay. We'll get to him in a second here. Cause I I've got thoughts on him and I'm interested to hear what you say beyond that point. Um, but what I'm saying is I think I got brainwashed by others 
and not just thinking to myself at any point watching college football in the last two years. And I'm going to say two years and not last year. Did I think there was a better wide receiver than Marvin Harrison? And my answer is no. Right. If we said probably at least 10 times on the podcast last year, that if he had been able to go into the 2023 draft, he would have been the top wide receiver that got picked. The quarterback play at Ohio State went down considerably from a guy that's now freaking Syracuse's starting quarterback. Okay, so like, I think I'm not going to dot Marvin Harrison Jr. because he had to play with Kyle McCord instead of uh, C.J. Stroud. The, the right? thing about Harrison, and this is so obvious, he catches the ball. Like, well, and are... look, and I and there's been unusual behavior too with like the combine, right? And then the way he went about the pro day, you know, it, it it invites speculation about what is he hiding or what does he not want them to see. For my money, this is just my opinion. He will go down as the wide receiver version of Peyton Manning in that his father was a great player and he came from outstanding bloodlines and he somehow was able to be even better than his dad. I think Marvin Harrison Jr is a Hall of Fame level wide receiver. Now, that's my I mean, a opinion. huge part of that is where he goes, right? Because well, no doubt. No, no doubt. But let me just finish my point here. I would I say that, but I come back to I would still trade the pick. If we're talking about a situation where like the Bills are going to make a Julio Jones trade or somebody's going to come up and give you a couple of first round picks and a second round pick, you still do it. You still absolutely do it. Even with what I just said about like my expectations for Harrison, because that's just my opinion. It could easily be wrong. I mean, look at the wide receivers that have been picked in the top five in the last 10 years. You've got Corey Davis and Sammy Watkins and guys like that. I'd rather have three first round picks and more chances than one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that that makes sense. I also think that the days of that Julio Jones trade are over. Is there a team in the NFL that's giving up multiple first round picks for a non quarterback? Like, do you? We've seen it for Jamal Adams. Like we, we, but that was a veteran. We saw it for Jalen Ramsey. It's a veteran. I, I just think all of those trades age pretty poorly. Now, obviously, Julio Jones worked, so all is hi- is hyperbole there. But I would not trade multiple first round picks for a veteran player that's not a quarterback or a rookie. That's not a quarterback. I just think it's way too risky for a a player that can be can be great, but is not going to be the guy that you win Super Bowls because I I, I think it's close. I'm like 55 45 that I would trade the pick because I do think Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be an all time great wide receiver. Yeah, he's he's very, very special. I agree with you for the Chargers and the Giants. And by the way, I I like how you have this thing set up and you put a lot of work into it. So we're going to do it. But we will get to the Stefan Diggs trade. And it's like a little further down the rundown than it probably should be for NFL news. But we're doing this exercise kind of first. and Well, wait a minute here. Can we just say this on the fly? I'm just going to say this. I'm not making a promise that might end up being an extra point that might end up being its own. Little it's own pot. Well, I didn't know how much yes. work we were planning on doing tonight, but that's fine. It could be an extra <laughs> point. That's fine. Um, because the Schefter thing that came out about it is fascinating. Yes, but, all right, yes, we'll get it is. We'll get to it. Chargers and Giants. Your question is which team needs Malik Neighbors more? I feel like the answer to that is pretty clearly the Giants. Because the Chargers, while they would love him, if they get Joe Alt, that's great. If they get Roma Dunze, that's great. They're tearing the thing down to build it back up again, but they have the quarterback, and I know we have slightly dis- levels of disagreement on just how good Justin Herbert is, but if if I think he's a top five talent and you think he's a top 10 talent, we both think he's a spectacular football player who can make guys around him better. So while if he got Malik Neighbors, it would be excellent for Malik Neighbors and Justin Herbert. It's not like he needs him, but the Giants, they they need a superstar on offense in the worst way because they don't have one. The Chargers have one, and he's their quarterback. So I do think the Giants need Malik Neighbors more. Would you rather have Odell Beckham Jr.'s career or Isaac Bruce? Would you rather be someone? I understand who, the question. 
Okay. The you're saying that the the peak of Odell Beckham was higher than the peak of Isaac, Isaac Bruce, but Isaac, Isaac Bruce's career was longer no, and more uh, productive. No, I'm more saying like I think that if Neighbors goes to New York, he's Odell Beckham Jr. in that he is going to be a breathtaking like appointment viewing regardless of who his quarterback is NFL star for the next few years and he'll take over New York and it'll be a huge personality there but I'm not sure how much winning he's going to do and I'm not sure how long it's going to last because quarterback uh, upheaval there and chaos and coaching changes even down the road and like does he get frustrated there and want out like I see him having a meteoric start to his career like Odell did, but I'm not really sure what happens after that. I know we, I know you and I have argued about Herbert before, but I really mean this. If he goes to the Chargers, I think he has a Hall of Fame career. I think that they, they have this great connection where we discuss the best quarterback-wide receiver combos in the NFL for the next five years, and that's consistently in the top two or three. And I think he, with Herbert and Harbaugh, they breathe life into a franchise in LA that desperately needs it. So who needs him more? Yes, the Giants obviously are a team that isn't as talented as the Chargers. But if you think about it, like what it could do for neighbor's career, but also like what it would do for the Chargers and their visibility. But that's a different question. Is it? Of course it is. The, Ch- the Giants need him more, but the Chargers would be a better spot for him. Okay, the but question, for the Chargers, the like... Where should Malik Neighbors want to okay, go? Okay, well, no, okay, fine. If you don't like that part of it, that's so be it. You're right. I am twisting the question a little bit that you I created. Changed the, like, you asked me. I answered the question how you wrote it, and then you answered a different question. Okay, but if, if Neighbors and Herbert create this dynamic duo in LA, it makes them relevant in a place, I think, where they're not. The Giants are going to be relevant regardless. So in that way, they would need him more. No? No. They need him more because they are worse. And he is a spectacular football player. And more I agree person- with you. I, I, I think it's going to be... I think him and... I think there are three wide receivers that are going to go, go down as all-time greats. In this draft, the neighbors is obviously one of them. Do you think Odunze is the other? Well, that's a topic we'll get to later in this rundown here. Okay. More first and pod after this. Back on first and pod, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend, and pre order Pipeline to the Pros. I know that's an NBA book, but Pipeline to the Pros, how D3 small college nobodies rose to rule the NBA. It's right here. Hold that up to the. The old, the old video. Yeah, make but, sure it's uh, in camera, Danny, because the first time you grab it, you put it off to the side. Boom. There you go. Bingo. Boom. Um. All right. Next question. Titans, Falcons. Who do you have as the best defensive player in the draft? I have Chop Robinson from Penn State. He's my pick. You're such a homer. Uh, did I go there? Do I live in State College? Am I in Central PA right now? No, You're I'm in not. Pennsylvania. Okay. Are you going to say Newton from Illinois here? Are you going to throw his hat? In no, the I'm no, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have missed that memo where Aaron Donald was the first defensive player off the board in his draft. So I just have to say it's either da- it's either Dallas Turner or the guy from Toledo. My bad, Danny. I'm sorry about that. You're wearing a Penguins jersey. You thought Kenny Pickett was going to be a superstar. Don't act like you're so offended by the idea of anyone calling you a homer. Yes, but you're who's calling the kettle black here? You said Mitch Trubisky was potentially going to win the MVP award when he was I just a bear. Was betting on him. Doesn't mean I think it was going to happen. Oh, so you're looking lose, for another I make losing loser? bets all the time. <laughs> I got a victory. Okay, so like, all right, well then the look, bet. if you if you're right. gonna throw my bias in my face, I watched Micah Parsons at Penn State. And I watched Chop Robinson at Penn State, and I think both guys have a lot in common. The guy ran the 40 in the same time as Dallas Turner, and he weighs more. He's bigger than Turner is. He is a he doesn't great... have a longer reach. He doesn't have bigger arms. Uh, Turner, Turner, Turner can 
you know, dunk a basketball flat footed. Oh, I didn't know he was Zach Eady. Now that's what we're we're looking he's, for. His, his arms are ridiculous. We're looking for defensive players that I mean, look so like. Why, per- why wasn't he more productive in college? It's a great. It's a great question. Um, because they moved him around. He played end. He's he was in the middle of the field at times too, just like Parsons was. He was a roving player in their defense. Okay. I get it. I mean, they had a guy Oway. Uh, at Penn State, who went to the Ravens in the first round. I don't think he had a sack his last year in college. Um, So, look, it's a very, very, very fair question. But from the measurables that I saw, I think he, if if he's put in the right situation, if he's used like Parsons, if he's allowed to be the guy that lines up in different places, jack-of-all-trades player, I think he's going to have an outstanding NFL career. So that would be my pick. So... I think the Bears are more likely to take Murphy than Turner because of the positional need, um, even though they really do need another edge rusher opposite Sweat. There's a play that that uh, that Turner had at Bama. They're playing Texas, and he's lined up over the right tackle, and the play's on the left hash mark, and the screen is to the left. It's a screen pass. And so, you know, Turner flies up the field in the backfield, but it's a screen away from him. And the running back gains like 20 yards down the left side of the field. And Turner chases him down and forces a fumble. Like the, the motor on the play is so special. The guy had to have covered 45, 50 yards running down the field and chasing this thing down to the other side. And so played at Bama, crazy athletic, high motor. It just feels like he's got a very, very high floor in a draft that people say is very top heavy and frankly, not that good. Once you get to the middle of the first round that I don't think that we're talking about a a hall of famer with any of these guys, but if you tell me that he's a freak of nature, physically he's played against the best, he's been productive and he plays his ass off. That makes me think that, He's got. He's the safest defensive pick in the draft. I'm most sure that he will have a 10 year career of any of the guys that I've seen. I didn't. That's not how the question was worded. It's not who was the safest defensive player available in the draft. It's who will be the best, Danny. Yeah, Disney. that's fair. I'm just. I. I think he's got the least chance to bust of any of these uh, guys. Jets. How much would Joe Alt change their I, offensive outlook? I mean, a ton, but. You scoffed at the idea of neighbors being there at nine. How is Joe Alt getting to 10? How is he getting to 10? How is that happening? Uh, The Titans and Bears take defensive players. Okay. Dallas Turner goes to the Titans and Murphy goes to the Bears and then Joe Alt is available for the Jets. I mean, they would do backflips to hand in that card for them i i think the giants could take alt i think the chargers oh could take all i'm so sick of the alt talk i watch every notre dame game because i was raised catholic and i actually loathe them one of the things that makes my saturdays brighter and better is when they lose and i love rubbing it in the face of people who i know that live and die with them i watched this guy play a ton all they did was i heard jack collinsworth make them out to be the second coming of Jonathan Ogden. He's a solid player. I don't see a great left tackle here whatsoever. Um, so you're so you're drinking whiskey and watching Notre Dame on Saturdays, scouting left tackles. I'm watching them like show basic blocks and make them out to be this great player. I just I, I never he gave up like two pressures last year. Oh, great! He did it against Navy and NC State. Congratulations on all his success. Okay. I mean, the guy's a mountain of a man. He's six. He's six eight, but three forty. Well, I, let me t- let me put it this way: I think if his dad had not played in the NFL, he would not be a first round pick. I think it's a bloodlines thing. Wow. Okay, so so you do not think that would be a good pick? Your Notre Dame friends and ask them to be honest about all, and they're going to tell you that he is very very overrated. And if they don't, then you know that they're just completely in the tank for Notre Dame. And they just say everybody who comes out of Notre Dame is a great player with no critical thought put into it whatsoever. So you do not think that'd be a good pick for the Jets? No. I think that Smith at left tackle is is better than him. 
And I think that Moses, the right tackle they got from the Ravens, is solid. So I don't think he would make that. Maybe in the long run he would, but not for this year. The Jets are a sneak. I'm back on the bandwagon. Here we go. The Jets are sneaking up on my list again. And they are going to be one of my must-bet teams. They're over. I've already locked it in. Aaron nine Rodgers. And nine and a half. Nine and a half. Whatever he needs I mean, to do to get his, whether it's, you know, make presidential campaign promises and spit, you know, wacky conspiracy theories. When we get to August, he'll be ready and they're winning at least 10 games. Well, he's 41 years old. So good luck. Vikings, Broncos, Raiders. What's the best bet? Which team to trade up for McCarthy? All right. So we know the Vikings like, and as crazy as this sounds, on some level, they like Sam Darnold. There's something about like the Darnold, the highlight reel, the throws he can make, where he was drafted, the pedigree, the offensive coach there, O'Connell. Like there's something about Darnold that they want to at least vet. They want to at least uh, watch, develop, and play out. There's some intrigue there. The Raiders gave Gardner Minshew that contract. You and I happen to be bigger fans of Gardner Minshew than most. We think he's a halfway decent quarterback. I don't understand in the AFC big picture where you're going with Gardner Minshew, but he can make them competitive. We almost took a team to the playoffs last year. They gave him a decent contract, and they have Aiden O'Connell there as well, and Pierce seems to like him. I'm not really sure why. Um, What the hell is Denver's plan? What are they doing? What Jared Stidham, baby. Is there a 2025 quarterback prospect that I'm unaware of that Sean Payton is just going to kick up his feet here? and try to go 3-14 and 14 and take the guy with the number one pick next year? I mean, what is their – getting a quarterback in this draft has to be their plan, no? But, dude, okay, how are they getting J.J. McCarthy with the 12th pick in the draft, no second rounder this year, and only, what, five picks or six picks? Uh, they, that's they, – they, they, they can't keep trading away draft picks. I, I think that they are maybe – a spot for Knicks or Penix if they're cool taking the fifth quarterback at 12 overall. But if I'm them, I am absolutely kicking the can down the road, saying we've got a great coach and saying we will play the long game here. And whether it's Shadir Sanders or the kid from Texas, Ewers or whomever it ends up being the guy next year, like don't take the, don't don't trade more capital. You, you traded stuff for Russ. You traded stuff for Sean Payton. Now you're going to trade for the fourth quarterback prospect uh, in this draft. That's just a terrible way to build a team. And you're going to feel. When has that stopped them before? No, it 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 hasn't. But uh, to me, the GM Minnesota- there has made some idiotic moves and has somehow kept this job. But the but Minnesota is interesting to me because of course. Because O'Connell's a great coach, and they have Justin Jefferson, and McCarthy does feel like Kirk Cousins. Smart, gets rid of the ball quick, can process things offensively, by all accounts, like a a coach's idealized version of a quarterback who will execute the game plan. And if the Vikings are going to live in a world where Jordan Love, the Lions, and Caleb Williams are in their division, they've got one of two options to be real bad and trade Justin Jefferson and bottom out or to upgrade at quarterback to try to keep up with the arms race that the NFC North is becoming all all of a sudden. So I, I think that McCarthy, I would bet him to be a Viking as of right now. You know, I, I heard that after the combine and the Vikings, the Denver can want them all they want, but Minnesota has the ammunition Correct. To actually go up and do it. It's just the the Darnold thing and how coaches continually seem like they can mold him and make him into a good quarterback is the one thing that's complete that's keeping me from completely agreeing with you on this one. All right. I liked your next question. Saints, Colts, Seahawks, Jaguars. You're looking for a mid first round draft po- prospect that you'd bet on having an all pro career. I'm going to give you Xavier Worthy. Speed kills, man. And he's small. There's no question about it. 
But if you watch those highlights, it's not all bubble screens and slants and deep balls. He plays a lot bigger than 175. He's a good route runner, and he will go over the middle. Tyree kills the best offensive weapon in football. He's the toughest guy to game plan for. I know McCaffrey had the incredible season, and you could argue Justin Jefferson and other guys are better route runners or whatever. But the toughest dude to game plan for is Tyree Kill. It's obviously a 99th percentile outcome. But I do think that there's a world in this modern NFL where smaller wide receivers are... It's just easier because you can't jam them as much as the line of scrimmage. You can't headhunt across the middle. It's just it's easier than ever to be productive when you're quote unquote undersized. This guy's got some really, really, really impressive film. I I could see him being an excellent NFL player. So I'm going to give you Xavier Worthy, the speedster from Texas. It's a pretty compelling argument. I mean, you know, when when you're when the numbers at the combine elicit John Ross comparisons. That scares me, but I agree. I give you credit for what, you know, you are so busy with your kids and everything else. The fact that you're watching highlights on guys that probably won't even end up being Bears draft picks is just a kudos to you and your devotion to what we do. On this I, I like this stuff, man. I, listen, I'm not saying I've watched an hour of it, but you watch. No, I know. They've got, they've got 10 minute YouTube highlights right. on all of these guys. And I love it. It's, I'm, it's, I'm, a, it's a fun, it's a fun way to kill time. I agree, man. hundred percent. Um, I like Adunze here, and you might. He's not a mid-round player, dude. Okay, we're he's, gonna make a bet. Uh, Odunze, Odunze is, Odunze is. We're I think gonna, he's a top ten pick. Odunze we're gonna make a bet here, then probably at some point, because the because the odds will come out in the next couple of weeks of over under where a guy gets picked, and they'll set a number, and his will probably be like eight and a half or nine and a half, and I think he's gonna go later than that, and I think the teams that pick receivers before him won't regret it because I think Harrison and neighbors will. And I'm usually not someone that says all the top guys at one position. I just killed all who everyone, you know, is making out to be this great player. Uh, I watched Larry Fitzgerald at Pitt and watched him in the pros, obviously. And they put that comparison up at the combine. And I said, this is ridiculous. There's no way at all. He, he looks like on tape or in games like Fitzgerald did. Yes, he does. He absolutely does. Dude, this, I, Odunze is going to be a top 10 pick. I don't and think the, the Bears stuff about his pick. like character and commitment to being a great player, going to be a complete stud. We'll go to multiple all pros. We'll be a number one wide receiver in the NFL in, in two or three years max. He is like Fitzgerald is more of a throwback player. I'm trying to think of a guy like right now who he reminds me of. Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams is exactly what I was about to say, dude. Incredible. Dude, dude I, I, didn't know, I didn't know that Odunze counted for this question. Yeah, Odu, Odunze is excellent. I think I, I really think he's the most likely guy to go to the Bears. All right. At, at nine. I, he, is, he is real. I mean, and by the way, Shane Waldron, new Bears offensive coordinator, they had Lockett. They had DK Metcalf. They used a first-round pick on Jackson Smith and Jigba. So I don't think Keenan Allen here Good takes point. them out of the running for a receiver uh, at all. Bengals, percentage chance they deal T. Higgins draft night. 18%. They keep saying, no, 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 no. It's not going to happen. It ain't happening. He's playing for us. Higgins keeps saying, I want a new deal. There's definitely a staring. I mean, they, you can stare at each other now because it's April. We're not close to games. Yeah, they, less than 20%. Less than twenty percent. I think that I think that they want to see healthy Burrow, healthy Higgins, healthy Jamar Chase, and remind everybody that they're the real contender uh, beh- behind Kansas City, and not this Houston stuff, and not Buffalo. So I know what Pittman got, and I know what Ridley got, and so those guys both got paid, especially Ridley, who counting stats look fine, but if you watch them, he did not look like an elite top shelf wide receiver this year. I thought there were too many inconsistent up and down games from him. So if you use uh, Ridley as the comparison, Higgins should get paid. But I think the holdup here is the guy was hurt last year and wasn't really that productive. He had 650 receiving yards. Who the F wants to give a guy 
who's coming off an injury plagued season with those kind of numbers, $95 million with $60 million of it guaranteed. And then at the trade picks on top of that. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's fair. Listen, I, th- I think Higgins is better than, than, uh, than Ridley. Um, but I think that that's totally fair. And I think that he is going to be a bangle. Um, he probably needs to prove it one more year, but I also, I also want to see him stay in Cincinnati for whatever that's worth. I want to see that. I want to see them run it back. Yeah. That's real easy for you to say. If he was playing for the Packers, and he was in your division, you would not say, oh, let's have him run it back with Jordan yeah, that's Love true. For, no, for another that's year. True. Yo, we're, this, we're, we are going way too long here, well, buddy. Well, we can speed it up. Come on, let's we got to go. speed it up. Uh, Rams-Dolphins, how much did defensive roster turnover change draft plans and affects their, affect their season outlook? An incredible amount, and I cannot believe where their win totals are for both of those teams already where the Dolphins are at nine and a half and the Rams are still at eight and a half. I would 100% bet both unders. The Rams lost Aaron Donald and Vegas expects them to pretty much be the same team next year. Are you frigging kidding me? I understand they had, you know, immense draft luck and nailed picks like Puka Nakua late in this last draft. That ain't going to happen two years in a row. I don't care if the GM there, Les Snead is, you know, fantastic, whatever. And then the Dolphins, you lost the defensive coordinator there. And your defensive line in your front seven was completely overhauled. And you've got Phillips and Chubb both coming off of injuries, Danny. Like, their off seasons, like, I I looked at them as dark horse teams. Now I look at them more as teams where, like, if they win nine games and make the playoffs, it's, it's a successful season. Like, that's like the ceiling on them for me with both Miami and L.A. Yeah, I think L.A. gets downgraded a little bit more than Miami because I think that Miami's got a better chance at having a top five offense if everything goes well for them and they could carry a 20th ranked defense. I don't think that's in the likely realm of outcomes for the Rams. We got to keep it moving more first and pot after this. Back in on first and pot, subscribe, rate, review. It's Pony's turn. It's his team. You're right. What are oh, the you Steelers? Sh- oh, yeah, you're right. Go ahead. What are the Steelers going to do about wide receiver? I don't know. I'm not. I'm panicking over <laughs> this. I'm not happy with it. Like, I did not like Deontay Johnson. He was there a could, guy there that could I, be eight wide receivers taken in the first round. They're not going to take one. Uh, I've been told oh, it's good. like 99% that it's going to be an offensive lineman in the first round that they're going to just. after Broderick Jones last after year. After Broderick Jones, yeah. And they're just going to test their luck that they find a way to get wide receivers in the second and third round, which, all right, that was true about George Pickens, you could say, but how about Chase Claypool before that, who was an absolute bust before we fleeced you guys in a trade and you took the old maid card off our hands. Um, They don't want to make a deal with Tyler Boyd because they want to underpay him and lowball him because he's from here. Uh, They missed out on other guys in free agency. I don't see them giving up the draft capital to trade for one of these studs. I mean, I hope the Ayuk thing gets revisited and happens, but if it doesn't, their second wide receiver is going to be Van Jefferson. That sucks. So yeah. I'm very concerned about what's going on at wide receiver for them. Lost in the euphoria of what they did at quarterback is the fact that they have a hole at left tackle, center, and wide receiver, and I don't think they're plugging all three in this draft. That would be very difficult to do. Um your next team that you put down here, Eagles. Phil- Eagles, are they in a good draft spot? So, I feel like the answer to that is actually yes. Yes. Yes, it is. And did you do the same thing I did where you're like, huh, let me just kind of look to see what the Eagles did this offseason again, just to clarify my point. And I'm like, damn, I like their roster a lot right now. Yeah, they they made pretty significant additions. They they are a good team on paper. They underachieved, but they seem to have made some solid moves. And like, it feels like if the run is going to be by the time they get on the clock at twenty two, that five quarterbacks will have been taken, and five wide receivers are going to be taken, maybe more at receiver you throw in a few offensive linemen that'll be off the board 
they'll get a top seven to ten defensive player in the draft. Like I don't think Byron Murphy will be there, but he's a popular guy that people think could fall in the draft. They could get Nate Wiggins, the corner from from Clemson. Like they're going to get a good defensive player at that spot. What if they get Latu, the DN from UCLA, who might be the best defensive end in the draft, yep. but he had the he had the terrible neck injury that forced him to transfer. And I don't really get why everyone thinks he's going to fall because he's played two seasons of college football with perfect health and good production. So I'll give you another guy who's right up their alley, their alley Kool-Aid from Alabama, who before yeah. this season was looked at as a top five pick. The other Alabama corner passed him by, but we know Roseman is a pedigree snob and the guy was a huge recruit and up in, in the year before had an elite season. They have older corners. I would not be shocked if that's the guy they take with that pick. Uh, Cowboys. Danny, this will be the first big move of the offseason for them. So what do you think they're thinking? What do I think they're thinking? I think that they're probably saying offensive line. Guyton, the kid from Oklahoma. Mims from Georgia. Latham. Something like that. And just and saying that they've got they got old on their offensive line, and that excellent offensive line. All of those guys have fizzled out now. I mean, obviously Frederick's long gone, Zach Martin, Tyron Smith, and like they they need to start rebuilding in that regard. And they've got excellent players at premium positions on the defensive line in their front seven defensively. So, I mean, obviously Jerry Jones always likes a weapon. And I don't think like Brock Bowers is going to be available or anything like that. But I, I, I think offensive side of the ball, uh, and I would I would bet tackle for the Cowboys. You kind of stole my thunder with Bowers. He's not gonna be there. Well he I mean he is a Jerry Jones pick, but I just I don't think he's gonna I'm be there. I'm just saying at some point you and I are gonna go through the exercise of putting a player with a team in the next couple of weeks. I don't see an obvious team for him for Bowers. Well, but that but, but that's because that every team could justify it. Well, I well, I know Jerry Jones would cuz he'd look at it as a CD Lamb situation. So that's just to me a team that I, I would y- Yes, I agree. But it, it's like the question with who's going to be a mid-round all-pro and you took Odunze and I think he'll be off the board in the top 10. Like if 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 Bowers is there in the mid 20s. All right, yes, I'll I give agree. you another Dallas one then if you think I'm cheating. I think the other well, Texas it's, it's, I'm just saying I, I think I agree with you. I just don't think he'll be there. I think the other Texas receiver is a possibility for them, Mitchell. Oh, um, I don't know, Mitchell. Yep. Yeah. Packers, Bucks. I wrote down this could be a spot for a team to trade back into the first round for Knicks or Pennix. Now, you said earlier you think all five guys will be gone by by now. Okay. Well, no, no, uh, five, five of the six. Who? Ha- yeah, that's right. Who has a better chance to be a good pro, in your opinion, among the two, Pennix or, or Knicks? Yeah. <sighs> It's such a hard question because these guys are like our age because they played in college football so long. And there's part of me that's like when they're 24 and, and yeah, I mean, there's obviously older guys that are playing defense too, that have stuck around longer, but it's like they pretty much should be in the NFL. And instead of, you know, being on a practice squad or being a third stringer, they're getting to play college games still at 24 years old, 23 years old. So I don't think either of them is the, is the honest answer. Like, I think that sometimes these bulk quarterback classes, the the guys just get overdrafted. I don't, I don't think that there are six first round quarterbacks. Now Lamar Jackson was the last first round pick in his class. And he ended up being the second best one, or maybe even the best one. Yeah, I mean, a guy is a two-time MVP and going to the Hall of Fame. So, yes, for sure. But I, generally speaking, if if, if there's going to be six first-round pick quarterbacks here Ugh. and the over-under is two-and-a-half to get the, – the over-under would be two-and-a-half to get second contracts with the team that draft him. And I wouldn't want to bet the over. So, I think – so So my, my answer is neither. But if I had to give you one – I'd say Penix 
because I do think that he has special arm strength. I do think he has top half of the NFL, top 10 arm strength, and we've seen him be massively productive in college. The, the multiple knee injuries would concern me for sure, obviously, the age, as you mentioned. But I do think that, you know, Drake May, Caleb Williams, Penix, those are the top three arms in the draft. So that would that 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 would be that would be my answer, but I don't feel good about it. There aren't many guys in today's NFL who look and play like Bo Nix. You know, Bo Nix to me, like talking Bo Nix, I, I'm gonna just say it, like there's a lot of Kenny Pickett in there. So I'm not gonna oh, make you're learning. Oh, right. So I'm not going to do this again. Um, you know, Penix, you know, at least with him, even at Indiana, he elevated the guys around him. So he got injured a lot, but he was good every step of the way. So I would agree. I would say him, but you're probably right. They're both going to be washouts and backups within five years. I don't want to do the bill the Bills thing now. We'll do it as yeah, a Yeah, we'll do that on the extra point. Correct. All right. Lions and Chiefs. You have both teams drafting players at positions with troubled players. Yeah. So Cam Sutton got cut. Lions need a corner because of oh, what happened Rasheed with Rice, him. Is that what and you're Rashe- saying? And Rasheed Rice. Do you agree with the Rasheed Rice thing? I I know the Chiefs can and will take best player available. But if wide receiver is as good as everybody says it is, it does feel a little too obvious for them to not take one. Uh, I don't know if – do you think Keon Coleman's going to be a first-round pick? No. See, I don't either, but there's something about him and the Chiefs that just makes sense to me. Because if there's anyone that could make him be a 10-touchdown guy – it's Andy Reid and Pat Mahomes. We're so just going to Coleman is the wide receiver from Florida State that was at Michigan State before that, correct? Yes. So you watched him, you've seen his highlights? Dude, watch watch this catch that he Do you remember the catch he had against Syracuse? Yes. Did but let me ask you a game? question. Who did he remind you of when you watched it? When you watched him? Did he remind you of anybody? Are you going to say John Baldwin? No. Why is that what you were going to say? I was I, well, I was thinking I was thinking because uh, I mentioned the Chiefs, you being a pit guy. No, so like it's interesting because you're reciting like this acrobatic catch that he made, but I actually thought with his route running and like and like how much of a when I watched him, what a technician he was. He honestly reminded me of reminded me of Keenan Allen. He's bigger, isn't he? I'm I'm not saying he I'm, I understand that. I'm not talking about from like a height and weight. I'm just saying like. His ability to run routes and yeah. get open is what stood out to me the most. And I watched them play probably seven or eight games. This he past had year. terrible quarterback play throughout his entire college career, and so he had he some of the some of the catches that he makes. It's like he's open. Well, Jordan Travis was a good player. You don't think so? Is he going to be in the NFL? No, but if he hadn't torn his ACL, they would have made the playoff, and he would have probably been. Not a Heisman finalist, but he would have been considered a top ten quarterback from college last year. How many year. games did he play with him? He played probably played nine. Did he? Okay. Um. Yeah. So I mean, I I do think the Chiefs will take a receiver, and it feels like the Lions need to take defense. So I agree with you. I I, I said him earlier for uh, whoever I said, it, but w- Wiggins, the corner from Clemson. Make make sense for Detroit also. Last one, and this is more big picture because of where they finished and how they're where they're picking in the draft. Right now, as these two teams get ready to pick with the roster moves they've made, do you agree with odds makers that the Ravens and 49ers are drafting with the best chance to knock off the Chiefs? I mean, obviously the Chiefs just are the favorite, deserve to be the favorite, and no one else is on their tier. So with that caveat out of the way, um, well, I, only, I worded it that way. Have the best chance. Yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the only other team that I'll throw in is the team that I picked to be in the Super Bowl against them last year, and it's the Lions. I can't believe Ben Johnson's back, man. The, their, their offense is so good, and we know that they can win shootouts, and we know that they are going to be they're going to be well coached and play hard. So 
I do think that the Lions deserve to be in what, however big tier two is in the NFL below the Chiefs. I, I just I believe the Lions deserve to be in tier two. Um, I think that those two teams are close, but they're not the next two teams for me. The next two teams for me, you're not going to like one of them. You say the Packers, the Packers and the Texans. Well, the Texans are the the trendy team. Yes, I know. The Tex the Texans are the trendy team. But and they're going to be very 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 good. Um Yeah. All right, well, let's tell everybody that this is it for now and we are going to release an extra episode that covers what the Bills did and what the Texans did with the Dicks trade. Okay. And subscribe, rate, review to this podcast, please. And, and go thank watch you to Spencer Danny, Ray for working long tonight. And go watch Danny on his cowherd appearance on the volume and go buy his book about that pipeline of guys from Division Three basketball to the NBA. It is actually in the on-deck circle of my reading list right now. Oh, I appreciate it. It is that, next man. up. I'm not just saying that to bust your balls either. It is on that. Pipeline to the pros, how D3 small college nobodies rose to rule the NBA. First and pod, thank you for listening. Peace.